Alright, so in the last session we completed the platform transformations and then we saw one transformation called as XML map in the integrator set. Now I'll go and look at the subsequent transformations in the integrator. Right. So the first transformation that we see is once again. Alright, the first transformation that we see is data transfer. Alright, so if you look at the description, it says allows a data flow to split its processes into sub data flows and push down resource consuming operations to the database server. So, what does that mean? Now, if you look at a data flow, what exactly happens in a data flow? We spoke about this multiple times because this is the key or the entire story what happens in data services. Now if you look at a data flow, data flow will have a source table, it will have a target table or one or more transformations in between. Source table, target table and transformations. So what exactly happens when we execute a job? When a job gets executed and when it gets into this data flow, it will pick all the data from this source and push it into the system cache. And from there, it will try to see what we are trying to do. Let us say if we are trying to do a group by or a filter or a join or whatever the, tran the transformation is trying to perform. Yeah, Anita, I will. I haven't shared it with anyone. I will. Okay. Yeah. So whatever the transformation is is doing, right? So this transformation, the the activity that is done by the transformation will be done in the system cache, and that is again. I mean, those iterations will happen within system cache. So let us say you are trying to. Uh, do a decode statement or an if then else statement on a particular column. So for each and every record that logic is repeated here on your system cache and once the activity is completed then it gets flushed into your target database through your target table. Right, so all these activities that are done by the transformation are done in your system cache or utilize, it will utilize your system cache. So a lot of space is required. So let us say if you are trying to do more than one complex operation within your job, right? you are trying to perform multiple transformations. Right, so what will happen? So it will try to do transformation one, then it will try to do the transformation two, and it will try to do the transformation three. Because syntactically it is correct, we can go ahead and do that within data services. But you also need to keep a check on the volume of the data that is present in your source table or multiple tables, so that you can well decide like if you go and do this transformations or a combination of transformations if your system will run fast or slow down. So to build a scenario on that one, I'm calling this as job underscore job dt. data flow data transfer. Now open this and uh, as of now we have less volume of data in the source tables but just assume that there are another two or three zeros after the record volumes. Right, if you look at this data in the source orders table we have 830 records so let us assume that it is 83,000 records. Right, and then this table has All the details has 2,155. So, you know, let us assume that there are another two zeros at the bottom. Right now, if I'm trying to do a lookup from this table's data to this table's data, so in how many iterations will happen? Right? 8,300 into 2, 1, 5, 5, 0, 0 times 
those many records will be generated on your system cache when you are just trying to do a lookup. So if you are trying to do multiple operations, right? So the first one I'll try to do is a Qt underscore lookup. So one second, guys. The second one that I will try to do is a Qt underscore group by. So last time when we did a lookup, if you remember, we used a validation transformation, right? So now this time we will try to see how we will utilize a function called lookup ext to do a lookup using query transformation. Right, I'm naming this as data transfer target table. And remember very well that, uh, you know, if you are working on a backend database as an Oracle, your table name should not exceed 30 character length, nor your column names should not exceed 30 character length. So that is a limitation on Oracle. Now, this has huge volume of data, and I'm trying to do, do a lookup here. So let us do that activity. To do a lookup, select all the columns here. or the required columns and map to the output. And to perform a lookup using query transformation, select the order ID column, okay, and on the mapping you will see to which field it is mapped to. So since we are trying to do a lookup, just comment that and go to functions, right, go to lookup function, select lookup ext, click on next, and then click on the drop down, select the data store where the lookup table is present, which is order details in our case, and click on OK. Now here you have two things. One is your input table, and the second one is your lookup table. Uh, guys, request you to be on mute because I hear a lot of echo. Thank you. All right, so these are the two tables. One is my input table and the lookup table on which I will be doing a lookup. So if you select this column, column in the lookup table, click on the drop down and you will see the fields from the lookup table here. So if you just click on this one, these are the fields. The same fields will be displayed here. So the condition that I am going to write is if the column in my order uh, lookup table is equal to the column or the value in that column, to be more precise, is equal to the value in the column from my source table, then return the same ID. And if it is not present in the lookup table, the default value that it will return is null. Right? So this is the condition. If the value in the lookup table or the order ID column of the lookup table is equal to the order ID that is present in my source table, then written the same value. If it is not present in that table, you have to return a null, right? So just click on finish, and your function is generated, right? Lookup ext underscore the data store and the table lookup table type of cache that is utilized. So if you want to modify this one, Select that, I mean, just click on the lookup ext, the function name, right click and say modify function call. So, a quick interview question, right? Modify function call was not present in data services 3.0. It is, uh, you know, it is the first thing that uh, is a part of a change in data services 3.2, and there were few bugs in data services 3.0 which were fixed in 3.2, right? So, this is the function that we will be writing to do a lookup. And then in the second one, back to our case. So if I'm trying to do a group by on all these things, so how does a group by work? Or before even talking about a group by, how does the lookup work? So every record of my 
source table is looked upon to that table, which means in our case 830 into 2155 iterations will happen. So less volume of data, that's fine. But if you have huge volume of data, that is going to occupy a lot of system resources. And the second thing, we are trying to do a group by, and we spoke about group by, how group by works uh, in a query transformation session. So these group by, so let us say when I want to do a group by on 830 records, the first record is compared with 829 records, remaining 829 records, the second is compared with all the remaining records, the third is compared with all the remaining records, and how many iterations will happen? 830 minus, uh, sorry, into 830 minus 1 iterations. So let us say on an average you are trying to run 1000 records in a group by 1000 into 9000, sorry, 999 uh, iterations will happen. Right, so which is like 900,000 records will be generated in your system cache and out of which the output will be pulled out. So this is also a resource consuming activity. Now, let us say if I run this job or you are working on a production support case and uh, you know, or you have done some development and let us assume that uh, you, you have put some complex operations within your query trend, within your data flow uh, and use multiple transformations within your data flow and your data flow is taking a longer time. Uh, when we talk about the next uh, topic which is data services management console, sorry for jumping into this but this is where we see how exactly we will find out as an administrator we will go and find out which data flow is taking a longer time out of the entire jobs that you are running in your uh, data services local repository. We'll look at the performance. How do you find out uh, which data flow is taking a longer time a little later? But let us assume that this is taking a longer time. Now, uh, you know, generally what happens is when we start working on the projects, right? So some organizations, big big organizations like uh, okay, I don't want to take the names, but what they will do is they they will ask you to first. Uh, you know, go and prepare the TFS document, which is technical and functional specification, and then they will want you to write a pseudo code, uh, or at least give the job name, data flow name, and in each and every data flow, what logic you are trying to implement, so that you foresee what you are trying to do or what you are trying to build. And once your document is approved, your TF technical specification is approved, then only they will allow you to start working on the code. Which means you have already given the data flow names and everything. And now once your development is done, you face a hurdle that your job is running for quite a long time. Or the second business case is you are working in a project, a uh, production support project and uh, there is a request or a change request from the customer asking you to improve the performance of the job. So in these two cases, you, you cannot go and add another data flow. If the business allows you, you better split that into multiple data flows and do it. But if the business don't allow you to change or add one more data flow to this job, so what you can do is you can go and utilize the data transfer transformation. So how does this work? So this data transfer transformation, it will go and split your data flow into two sub data flows, right? So it will take this part as df underscore one, and it will go and take this part as df underscore two, and it will split it into two sub data flows. So what happens once your data flow is done? Your system cache will be flushed. So on the coding part, if you go and see on your job, you'll still see only one single data flow, which is df underscore dt. But if I include the data transfer transformation in between these two, right, and run the job, the job will, while executing, you will see two sub data flows. One is df underscore dt underscore one, which is this part of the job. And the second one is df underscore dt underscore two, which is this part of the job, right? So this data transfer transformation, now go back to the definition and see. It allows a data flow to split its process into two sub data flows and push down the resource consuming. So what are the activities that you are trying to perform, which are consuming a lot of resources, they will be pushed down onto your system. 
or onto your back on database to improve the performance right so if you open the data transfer transformation just adding a data transfer transformation itself is enough because uh, it is by default enabled right one thing and it will it will have a default option like automatic like it will automatically choose based on your volume of data how to push down the resource consuming activities or resource consuming space right so just if you add a transfer uh, in between your code automatically it will do a push down and it will split your data flow into two sub data flows but for you to understand what exactly happens in a data transfer transformation right so there are three methods one is data transfer type is automatic which you are asking the system to choose which is the best scenario based on your volume of data and the other one is table and file so when I select the table right so when I select a table the table options are enabled and if I click on these three drops uh, three buttons like three dots button uh, what I will see is I'll see the data stores which means it will allow me to create a table through these data stores one of these data stores and when I select on a particular data store and click on OK it will by default give a table name right this table name is nothing but a new table which means uh, remember do not give an existing table name here because this will drop and recreate that table at the runtime which means it will create a table push the entire system cache your data into that table and once your job is done it will go and delete that table from the database right since we cannot do that or see that on the database I'll show you the file option so when I select the file it will activate the file options and if you go and try to do it on the desktop and give the file name as a little unique one so that you can easily identify the file right I gave the name as one two three four five six seven dot txt right now once your code is done validated to see if there are any errors no errors found now select the job right click and execute it two things that we have to identify we'll go back to the log a little later press F5 keep pressing F5 or just I'm refreshing the desktop to show you a file that is generated which has the entire data and continue pressing F5 and it will be deleted automatically which means your job is done so one thing that we noticed is uh, when you executed the job a file that is pushed on to your desktop and you know once the job is done it is automatically deleted the same way it will uh, if you go and choose a table option what it will do is it will go and delete that table uh, or it will sorry first it will go and create a table on the database with whatever the information that is present in your system cache it will flush it and then once your job is done it will be deleting it so what exactly happens in the back end so this part whatever the calculations are done is present in your system cache so those are pushed on to your backend persistence which is your file on the desktop or to your backend database and that becomes an input for the second set of uh, second subset of your data flow and once your job is executed your target table will flush the data into your target database which means within the same data flow you're trying to or you're flushing your system cache twice which will improve the performance of your job and now we have seen how it does a flush onto a persistence file but now if you look at the job we have only one data flow called df underscore dt and now if you look at this this is the process to execute the data flow and once the data flow is executed automatically it started to identify the first half of the job which is which we have before the data transfer transformation as df underscore dt underscore one as the first subset and then 
once this df underscore dt underscore one is completed successfully, it went ahead and started, which is df underscore dt underscore two. So we did not create any data flows like df underscore dt underscore one or df underscore dt underscore two, but the system automatically generated these two. Right, it splits. Now you go back and see the definition. Allows the data flow to split its process into two sub data flows and then push down the resource consuming operations to the back end database server. Right, it can be your database server or your persistence based on the option that you select. And in future, if you want to remove the data transfer uh, for another location when you are trying to run your job, uh, you know, you, you pretty much are aware that your source data volume is less, then you can just uncheck this one. There is no need for you to de uh, delete this one and do the remapping again. You can just uncheck this one if you want to remove this in the future. Right, so it, this is as simple as such, but this does a lot of change in your job performance and uh, improvement. All right, so that is with our data transfer transformations. Uh, I hope it is clear. If you have any questions, we can go ahead and ask before we. Yeah. Yep. Why don't we use the same group by? Uh, I mean, group by option in the same query transformation. You can, uh, so let us say if you are trying to you know, do a lookup here, right? And the output of that one should be grouped by. So if you are doing a group by, whatever is coming on the source will be grouped. But here you are trying to do a lookup and based on if the volume is present, then you want to group a value. And if it is not present, it will return a null. So you want to do a group by. So if you are not, if your previous transformation or your current transformation is not dependent on the previous transformation, you can do everything in one single query transformation. But again, that is what I am saying. If you end up, see, you can do the entire project work within a single query transformation, but that will hit your performance a lot. So that is the reason why you have to break your activities into subsequent data flows or transformations. Oh. That is just to improve the performance. Thank you. Yeah. All right, the next transformation that we'll be seeing and that will be the least used in the project is date generation, right? So this, I haven't yeah, used I it. Have one. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, this data, transform uh, data transfer transformation we can use in any situation, right? Any, uh, between a, any, uh, <coughs> any data flows. Sorry? Uh, can we use these data transformation between any any data flows like any transformation like a, a query to query or any between any, any to any? Yes, you can technically, but remember uh, we spoke about the map operation, right? So one once your map operation is in place, it will generate the opcodes, and in in those cases, if you are trying to use this table data transfer transformation between uh, two opcode sets, then definitely it will you know, lose those operations. So you should be careful when and where to use them. So if, if any transformation is not pushing out any opcodes, you can use it anywhere. That should not be a problem at all. So if we use a case transformation, then it should be before the case transformation, right? No, we are not talking about case. We are talking about the map operation. Yes, sir, sorry, sorry, map operation. Yeah, 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 we can before it, yes. And Adil, can it be broken into more than two? Yeah, because since we used one uh, data transfer transformation, this is divided into two subparts. Now, let us say if I have more number of transformations in my job and I want to fine tune it further, I can use it twice between my code and it will split that into three subparts. So, prior to this one and after this one will be considered as one set. So, let us say if I have one more data transfer transformation here and further query transformations and the other target. So that set will be considered into second set. And when you execute that, uh, you know, you'll have df underscore dt underscore one, dt underscore two, and dt underscore three. Okay, so the next one is date generation transformation. I haven't used this in my entire years of experience on data services. But, uh, you know, one of my student uh, who works with ESPN, uh, this guy gave me a good example for this. So I think that should be, or uh, that will be a quite relevant example which I can talk about. But, you know, I haven't used it, nor I have seen somebody using it in any projects. 
okay so this is right so going forward now you will be having the least user transformation because the most user transformation set will be your platform and uh, the other transformations they will be used uh, only on particular scenarios you will not be using them quite often right so now integrator has most of or most of the transformations that are you know in your integrator set are pretty less used but we will see how this works so df underscore date generation now select this transformation and drag into your data flow and now you see this is a source transformation this is not your intermediate transformation but this is your source transformations which means it has a connector on the right hand side right so intermediate transformations will have the connectors on either sides but since this is your source transformation it has a connector on your right hand side now if you open this transformation now you will have one system generated column which is this is this date is automatically generated by the system and the data type is date now in this date column what it will generate it will generate from a start date to a start date and what are the pattern in which by by which we increment it so let us say if I go and click on the drop down and select date click on first of this month and I'll consider the end date as end of this month click on OK and incremental you can go and select daily, monthly, weekly I'll select daily and just try to load it as it is into a target table So what it will do, it will generate a new output column called as di underscore date and it will load into the target table the date starting from first of this month to end of this month. Right. So this is a date generation transformation. So I really did not understand how we can you know generate a date for an existing data set because existing data set is something that is created over a period of time and you will definitely not have a record for each one record generated for every day unless and until you are in that scenario you will not be using this transformation but what one of my students who works with ESPN gave me an example is this can be utilized uh, you know to do a forecast analysis all right, you are trying to do a future projection saying that uh, quarter one of 2008 or quarter two, sorry, quarter one of 2016 to quarter two or quarter three or quarter four of 2016 when you are trying to do a projection sales, right, or projection estimates. So you can generate a date range in the future and try to do some calculations and map it to those say, calculations. So the start date and end, not end date should not just cannot be just for one month it can be like you know 1st of January to 31st of December and the incremental method can be monthly right and you can generate you can generate uh, three months of data here now on that data if you want to do some predictive analysis right so you can use this transformation uh, wherein you can do some future forecasting and then that one that is where you can generate a data uh, sorry generate a date column and tag the data to it because we are trying to do some predictive analysis and see how this particular product goes in the market in the next quarter based on the past history of sales so that is one thing that we can do with this transformation and this is how it works but we also have some date transformations uh, or date functions which we spoke when we are looking at query transformations we have functions in it and I told you that we will talk about these date functions in the relevant scenario
Right, so what we will do is, we'll first go and look at the, what are the date functions that are present. So drag and drop this to the output column and now if you click on the functions, you have something called as date functions. So if you look at this date functions, it says year, week in year, week in month, system date, system time, we know this date and system time, it will give you the date and time of your system. Then month, last date, Julian is weekend, financial year, sorry, physical year, day in year, day in week, day in month, right? So we have multiple date functions. What I'll do is I'll try to pick most of the date functions here and try to create an output and show you how it works. But when you create, you try in each and every one, uh, sorry, each and every function there. So I'm creating this one as year and it's an integer. Then... So I'm creating new output columns like year, month, day in year, and uh, day in month. So there's a question from Adil. So it's like this example based on the last three years. This year we do a predictive average sales for each month. Yeah. We can use that date generation transformation in that case. Correct. Right, so year, day, month, day, and uh, quarter. And all these outputs will be integers, right? So quarter one as it is, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, or fourth, and year will be a number, month will be a number, day in year, day in month. So that's the reason why I'm just creating new output columns with uh, the data type. Alright, so now I'll try to populate this with the functions. So select the year column, go to the mapping tab, click on function, go to the date function and select the year function, click on next and the input date column, click on the drop down. So now if you go through the wizard, you, you can also see the description what exactly happens here. The, door, the date whose year is to be extracted, which means you have to go and choose the column on which you are trying to get the year on. Alright, so this is the gender date. Then click on finish. Right? Or if you want to, if you know the functions and if you want to do it directly, so just type month of select this column, drag and drop it into the month. Then next one is day in year. So day in month, day in year, day in week. Right, so you can use any of this based on your requirement. Day in month, quarter gives us which quarter we are in, quarter one, two, three, four, and just make sure you close this with a closing bracket. All right, day in week. So I just created some new output columns and populating them with a the function. Now if I go and execute the job again, 
So it will create additional columns to the table and it will push those values into that columns. Like for example, the first one is picking year from the date and the second one is picking the month from the date. And the third column is saying which day of the year it is. Like it's almost end of the year, 365 days and another 30 days to go on the first of this month. Right? And then it will tell you the day in the month, which day in month is that, and which quarter are we in, and day in the week. So first of Jan, uh, first of December is the second day of the week. So if you go and cross check your calendar, right, it starts with Monday. So second day is Tuesday, right. So this is how it captures the values. And if you want to do some further analysis or you want to do some, you know, your input data is sending some date column and you want to capture something like quarter four, give some discounts, or quarter three, give some discounts, or based on the week, if you want to do some analysis. So you can use this uh, date functions and go ahead and split the data into subsets. And then based on that, you can do some calculations. And this is your date generation transformation. And the next one here, what we see is effective date. So what it does is it creates a new output column called as effective 2 and it does some calculations on that. We will see what it does actually. So now if you look at this table, Right, so I have a table like this which has one, two, three, four, five, and six. Right, and this says the fuel type is diesel, gas, And diesel is like 2.1 liters or 2.1 dollars a gallon. And uh, now it's converted to 3. And gas is like 1.6. And after that, it's done to 1.9. And again, diesel is like 3 to 2.8. And then to 2.6 right so this is a table which is capturing my fuel prices right and it says that on 1st of December it's 2.1 dollars and after that um, 10th of December you know it's three dollars and here again it's on 1st of December and 15th of December and here on 15th of December It is $2.8 and uh, 26th or 26th of December, it's converted to $2.6. So there is a change in the price. And this table has a column which captures the date when it is changed. But how about a more detailed information which says that from when to when diesel is 2.1 and when did it change to 2? Uh, or 3 and from when to when it is 3 and then when did it change or fall back to 2.8 and then to 2.6 right so this requires an additional column called as effective 2 which will capture this is from 1st of December to 9th of December it is 2.1 and from 10th of December to 14th of December Right, it is three dollars, and from fifteenth of December to sorry, and fifteenth of December to twenty fifth of December, 
it is $2.8 and from 26th of December to future date which is system will consider this as 9999 slash uh, 12 slash 31 so it is 31st December 9999 which is the system last date so it will give you the systems generated last date as a default date for that and similar will be the case from 1st of uh, gas from 1st of December to 14th of December it's 1.6 and 14th of December to the system generated last date which is because you did not have any change so it will take the default system last date as the last date and if there is a change then it will override this with that change date and it will capture the new records last date as the system last date so if we have a data like this right it will be more meaningful than having just a data like this so the, if you want the system to do that, so 10 records you can go and do that manually but hundreds and thousands of records it will not be possible for you. So if you want to do such kind of an activity, then you can use the effective date transformation. So I'll call this as job underscore effective date. Then data flow underscore effective date transformation open this so don't have a relevant data set for that but I'll be just using the order table because it has some columns which is called as order date or date column so I'll be using that column and try to show you right we have something called as order date and shipment date so this is not a relevant data set so remember when you're practicing you try to create something like what we have seen in the Excel I'll just show you how this transformation works. So connect it with your order table and open the transformation. And here you have two sets. One is your schema in, schema out, and the effective date area. So in the effective date area, select the column, which is nothing but the date column. So give the column on which the prices are changing, the date column, which is capturing the change of prices and then the sequence column which says that the the revenue column which is getting affected so let us say I just call it as fright so in our example what we need to select we need to give the date column as this one first and then the sequence column or the column which is maintaining this this thing is the price so give that and then the, it will it will capture the default date as the system last date this is 12 31 9000 it's not 9999 but it is 9000 so call this as effective date connect it to your target table and validate this no errors found oh yeah sorry one thing I think I told you mistake is like this will not be the price or the fright column but it will be a column called as a sequence number because this should have an order right if if I say that I jumble up the data by putting up this first and this first and this first right you will you'll not have any proper order the, there should be a column called a serial number I'm sorry for that just thought about it right so there should be a column which defines or which tells that this order in which these prices are changed is correct the dates are correct in the right order right so you should pass that column here in the sequence column so just let me pass some random column here or I'll just do a sequence by the employee ID and now when you go and execute the job once the job is done you should be able to see a new output column called as effective to column on the target table which will capture the start date and uh, sorry that will capture the end date of that change in the order right so if you want if you have so many columns and you just want to display the required columns what you can do is you can click on this button show or hide columns the last one and say hide all and you select the order ID, order date, 
and the effective two column which is the last column that is generated and just click on OK and it will just minimize this to only the three days right so now since there is no change in the data or we don't have the right data set it is showing this order data as whatever it is coming in from the source and the last date or effective to column is like the date on which or till which it is effective to right so it is showing the system date but you know try to create some flat file when you are trying to work on it and you know try to create a scenario around it so that will give you the right dates right the dates on which it is changed so we should be able to create this this effective to column which will give a more meaning to the data that you have in your system so that is with the the sequence column uh, right the sequence column will tell you let us say if I have to push this into a table and you know I push this so my table is like this instead of this so the columns are not in the order that is in which the date the data has changed now when it goes in, when it goes to comparison so first it will take December 1st as like 2.1 and then it goes to December 15th as 2.8 but you know it's it's a little around right so on actually December 10th there is a change to three dollars so there should be a column which is sorting the data and uh, you know giving it the just making us or making sure that this is in the right order in which it is incremented or the dates are in the right order in which it is incremented so that will be our sequence column which will say that this is the sequence in which these prices got changed okay so that will be our effective date transformation so if not present we have to uh, you know uh, create a new output column and uh, just you need to first go and check with the data owner just to make sure that whatever the data that you have is in the right order because if it is not in the right order then probably you might not capture the right changes on the data and then you need to you know if, if they confirm you that it is in the right order then you have to create a new output column and populate it with generator number and I use that as a sequence column okay alright so that's with the effective date and then we have another transformation next to it called as hierarchy flattening so what is hierarchy you pretty well know that A B and C D and E and F right so I can call or this is general hierarchy structure that we remember right so let's try to fill all those things with tick boxes now A is a parent and B and C are its children or you call this B as a child of A and C as a child of A and D and E are children of B and F is a child of C so this is a graphical representation which will let you know clearly that okay this is how my data is related to but now if you want to you know look at this you, you cannot save the data in this exact pattern right you cannot save the data so let me add more clarity to this this is my manager ID and uh, this is my senior lead ID so just to you know correlate to our IT org structure or I can call him as a principal consultant a PC B is a PC and C is a lead
then here this is a senior developer and E guy is a developer and F guy is a trainee now if you want to look at the relationship between the or how trainee is related to the manager trainee is related to the lead and lead is related to the manager and if you want to look how developer reports to a senior manager he goes through the principal consultant and from there it goes to the manager and similarly the senior developer reports to the PC and PC reports to the manager so this is the hierarchy so if you want to flatten this or put it in a flat structure so that it will be more meaningful to the business right so you can utilize the hierarchy flattening transformation and there are two types of transformations or two types of flattening that you can do using hierarchy one is your horizontal and the second one is your vertical so when I say horizontal it goes like this and when I say vertical it goes like this so I'm not just telling like what is horizontal and what is vertical but when I say horizontal what is the relationship between developer to manager senior developer to the manager trainee to the manager and if I go by uh, horizontal flattening it says like okay at the manager level how it is related which is a parent node which is a leaf node and at B how is it related uh, you know what is your parent node and what are your leaf nodes and here in this level it will again go and say what are your grandparents parents and what are your uh, subordinates or leaves right so this is how we can go and flatten the data using hierarchy flattening so I created a text file all right so the force flat file is there with the same data whatever we have seen in our scenario I just created one right I call it as hierarchy flat I'm mean, sorry I'm not just giving uh, the full names as I told you in the beginning FF underscore hierarchy underscore source but just keep it in mind that we have to follow the right naming convention I became a bit lazy that's your source inbound directory and uh, Alright, so I think I missed some of the files here. Alright, so just let me do a quick conversion. Well, I just pushed it into a flat file because you know on the server we have a problem connecting to Excels. The previous machine that I used to teach on has a good connectivity to Excel but this one has a patch issue and here now I saved the file as pc.txt select that one click on open and it will ask you to overwrite say yes 
and then go and select the delimiter as a tab delimiter overwrite the schema as yes and then skip the row headers as yes because this is your source flat file save and close now create a job and call it as job underscore Oops. One second, guys. All right, so calling it as job underscore hf, hierarchy flat thing, and data flow underscore hf. Now open this and then make this hierarchy as your file source. All right, now go to the transformations tab, go to the platform transformation and select the hierarchy flattening, drag and drop it into your data flow, connect it. Now open this transformation and you'll see two types of flattenings. One is your vertical and the other one is horizontal. So based on the mode that you select, right, the output schema will be generated. So you need to understand how many layers of data are there like what is the depth between or maximum depth between the data. So in our case we have uh, A as your manager or B and C as your uh, PC and leads and uh, senior developer, developer and tester at the leaf level. So the depth between the last leaf and the parent node is 2. Now, now I'm selecting a horizontal flattening so select the depth between them is 2. You can ask the data owners for the depth. So I just gave a relevant descriptions like what is the parent ID which is like which captures the first value and then its description drag and drop it into this attribute list and then the child column which is child and the child description into this one and just validate it will generate the output structure I just go back and uh, you know try to push that into a table hierarchy connected with your transformation validated to see if it is good no errors found now just go and run your job and this will do a horizontal flattening of your hierarchical data and it will give more meaning to your data now if you go and look at it it says that okay now this is my current leaf on which I am trying to look at and the level of the leaf is like on the top level which is 0 and at level 0 A is present and A I'm just looking at level this one right so I'm looking at only this one this is horizontal flattening right so at level this one it is level 0 A is present and the current leaf that we are looking since we are looking at A so it is not talking about anything so it is not talking about level B or level C so that is the reason why it gave you null and its descriptions and its level descriptions now you go to the last level which is F alright so just let me double click this right so this is my last level and at the last level One second, guys. All right. Close this thing. If the depth between F, which means this node or this layer and the top level is 2, right? F to C and C to A. And you look at the relation at level 0, which is on the top level, A is present level 1 C is present and the level 2 F is present manager lead and the trainee so it has managers child description and 
the parent is again lead and parent child description so that is the reason why you have lead and lead repeated so this is how you do a horizontal flattening on the data so that you can go and try to analyze uh, a data at a leaf or a layer level now if you want to do a vertical flattening so in the previous versions you just need to select the vertical flattening and validate it used to change the output structure but it is not doing in the current version so the recommendation is when you are trying to switch between horizontal and vertical within the same transformation just delete it pull this black in back into your data flow try to connect open this now pull your do the same mapping parent to parent and child to child and attributes to the respective boxes sorry make it as vertical right yeah I will yeah right so now validate and it will change the descriptions or it will change a new vertical structure which says that ancestors descendants what is the depth between these two what is the root flag leaf flag and its descriptions now since the target till is a template table it will be dropped and recreated so I'm not doing any changes on that one it will get adjusted with a new structure All right, the job is successfully completed now you go to your data flow and click on the data now this is a vertical flattening so ancestor is B and its descendant is D now between B and D I just try to remember this diagram I just can't switch right so between B and D the depth is 1 so that is what it is saying is B a root flag which means root flag is always the top node 1 right A is a root flag B is not a root flag so the indicator is 0 and is D a root flag yes obvious uh, is that a leaf flag yes that is on the last level so it is identified by 1 now if you want to see the relationship between A and F right A and F the depth between A and F is 2 and A is a root flag yes and F is a leaf flag yes and the relation between them is manager and trainee so this is how you can do a vertical flattening on the data right so these are the two types of flattenings that you can do which is horizontal and vertical so this is what you need to choose which type of flattening that you need to do uh, based on the functional guys expectations so let us say they say that okay I have the data like this and this is how I'm trying to look at it so based on his expectations you need to go and apply the right flattening and give the data to him so this is how the hierarchical flattening works and uh, you know I think we'll call it a day so yeah that's it In the next session the agenda is to complete the platform transformations and also the base match transformation from quality so that on Tuesday we can go ahead and look at the management console and Wednesday we will look at uh, or Tuesday we will look at both data services management console and uh, central management console. Rakesh, yeah. uh, what about the CDC uh, SCD types? We, we still have to cover that. We will. Okay. that is a part of our platform transformations we'll cover them okay okay and uh, what uh, data warehouse construction rules and uh, um, how can we construct data warehouse those things so when we are loading from flat file to a database which which is like we are constructing a database right for the customers right? not data data warehouse so, so what do you mean by data warehouse i did not get your I question mean, uh, for the construction data warehouse we need to follow some uh, rules right what kind of rules? Like uh, <coughs> surrogate IDs, uh, dead columns, flag columns. Yeah, that is one new output column to your query transformation, right? 
Mm. So if you want to capture the loss mod date, flags and all these things, insert update date, side date, source system ID. So it depends on what the customer is asking. You have to add in your query transformation in your output column and start loading it to the target. See, as a data services consultants, we will be responsible for loading the data into their targets. Right? So as they ask. It doesn't mean that we will be defining rules for their systems, but our intention is to pull the data from the source and load it into the target as per their requirement. So if okay. their requirement is clear, then we can go ahead and do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll again catch back on uh, the you. next session. Yeah. Take care. Bye.